this iChemie Safety Centre webinar where we're going to be talking about the Philadelphia Gulf Refinery 50 years on. My name is Trish Karen and I'm the Director of the iChemie Safety Centre. So today we have joining us Ewan Stewart who is on the iChemie Australia Board and he'll be joined by John Bishow and Rick Ehrlich and they'll be talking about the August 17, 1975 crude oil tank fire at the Philadelphia Gulf Refinery. Ewan, over to you. Thanks, Trish. Uh, so today we're going to hear about a lost case study. This is one which hasn't really been talked about in process safety circles. However, it, has, it is remembered within firefighting and fire engineering communities. There is so much to learn and so much that went wrong in this incident that Trevor Kletz once described it as hard to believe uh, in his 1976 ICI newsletter. Um, so we'll get into it. Um, first, first of all, a bit of background, um, putting Philadelphia on the map. So Philadelphia is located in Pennsylvania State on the northeastern seaboard of the US, bordering New York, New Jersey, and Ohio. Um, it's the, the birthplace of American independence and home of the Liberty Bell. The city of people that love to get dressed up and party during the annual Mama's Parade celebrations, and also a city of sports fans, although the, the Eagles weren't as prolific in the NFL as they are now. Uh, in 1975, uh, Sylvester Stallone was penning uh, a boxing uh, movie entitled uh, Rocky, which would make parts of the inner city iconic. So on the south side of the, the city lies the a sprawling refinery complex. Uh, what you see here is actually two refineries. You've got the Gerard Point refinery in the foreground, which was built in the 1920s. Uh, in the background is the Point Breeze refinery, which is actually much, much older. Uh, in fact, probably um, commissioned at some point in the late 1800s. Uh, at one point, 35% of the world's petroleum products came from Point Breeze. Um, so here you can see cutting right through the refinery is the uh, Penrose States, uh, Penrose Avenue Bridge. Um, commuters would use this road and also take you down to the, the sports complexes uh, to watch the 76ers or the Phillies uh, or the Eagles. And you can see here is the site of the, the incident, uh, the large tower that you saw on the first slide. Uh, so it would have been in full view of um, early modern computers. So in order to understand this incident, we have to understand a little bit about the operation of floating roof storage tanks. Uh, so floating roof storage is used with uh, hydrocarbons that can emit large quantities of vapor at ambient temperatures. Uh, yeah, so it's used for crude oil, naphtha, jet fuel. Um, and you can see it works by having a roof that sits on top of the, the hydrocarbon fluid, and that prevents any vapors from escaping. The roof actually floats on a series of hollow pontoons, uh, which gives it its buoyancy, and it has a, a number of roof support legs. Uh, these are only used when emptying the tank for maintenance. Uh, you can see also important to this incident is the pressure vacuum valve on top of the roof. Uh, this serves to prevent a vacuum forming when you empty the tank and also to expel air from underneath the roof when you're filling the tank. The, the tank involved in this incident was actually an internal floating roof storage tank which meant it had an additional external roof, um, which would protect it from the elements, so lightning and rain and so forth. And that's just a demonstration of how the, the roof floats on top of the, the liquid level as it's being filled and emptied. Uh, floating roof tanks have many of the same failure modes as um, regular 
um, atmospheric storage tanks, but there are a few unique failure modes to look out for. First of all, the roof can sink. Um, yeah, the roof can get stuck or it can sink. If there's heavy rainfall on the roof, then the roof can fall underneath the water level and um, expose the hydrocarbons on top of the on top of the roof. Uh, you can also have a rim seal fire, uh, so the the point of contact between the floating roof and the fixed wall of the tank. Um, you can get you know, small amounts of vapor escaping there, which can sometimes be ignited, let's say, by lightning. The thuds, unique failure mode, is roof landing, and that's what we're going to explore during this incident. So in the months uh, prior to this incident, uh, the modifications were being done to tank 231. This was originally built in 1929. It's a 73,000 barrel tank. Um, quite a common conversion, conversion at the time as environmental legislations were changing uh, to reduce emissions um, was to convert floating fixed roof storage tanks to floating roof storage tanks. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there was a design change uh, which meant that the the roof would the, the sport legs would be a little bit high, a little bit taller than originally planned and the up these updated drawings were yeah the updated drawings were not given to the, the site operators unfortunately so as they were emptying the tank on the night prior to the incident the roof was landed and the tank essentially came off float. And as they emptied the tank further, this allowed vapor to be drawn in through the pressure vacuum valve, forming a hydrocarbon air mixture with between the, the tank roof and the surface of the, the hydrocarbon. So on the morning of the 17th August 1975, a docked tanker was filling the, the tank um, and this expelled the, the hydrocarbon air mixture into the external tank. Um, the air gas mixture would have been heavier than air so it would have just sat on the top of the, the tank internal roof and as the tank was filled further it would have just risen with the tank roof until it reached the, the height of the external overflow events. The operators in charge were not um, monitoring the tank levels and they allowed it to be filled above its maximum safe operating level. Inevitably, this uh, gas cloud having escaped from, from the storage tank found an, an ignition source uh, in a nearby boiler house uh, where an, an uninsulated high pressure, high temperature steam line caused the first ignition and um, this uh, caused damage instantly to the, the chimney stack. The flame front then flashed back to the vents of the tank where a massive fireball erupted. Um, however, as the, as the tank was still being filled, the, the flame didn't, didn't yet propagate inside the roof of the tank. Um, however, the, the crew offloading the tanker uh, noticed the explosion and uh, shut off uh, their supply to the refinery. Um, so there was no more oil coming into the storage tank. And so the, the, the roof space was no longer pressurized and the flame front could enter the tank, causing this massive explosion, which forced the tank roof down like a piston, uh, causing a massive hydraulic shock, which uh, damaged the, the manifold fill lines. Um, unfortunately, these the, the damage was done outside of the, the dike area, so a fire started in the street. Um, at the same time, this force uh, kind of forced um, uh, burning oil up past the, the roof seals and out of the tank vents, which further continued to feed, feed the fire. Um, yeah, uh, frothing 
oil that was on top of the roof continued to burn and formed out of the vents, causing a number of other gaskets to fail. And at that point, there was no way of shutting off flow, back flow out of the tank, uh, which was feeding the, the, the fire from its 71,000 barrel inventory and about 12 meters of static head. So the, uh, the city fire department was notified and they were on scene um, soon after. Uh, initially, it was a six alarm fire, bringing about 200 items of firefighting equipment. Uh, there was another, a couple of other tanks in the dike. There was actually lines going through the, the dike that were not related to, they were not feeding any of the tanks inside the dike. Uh, there was you know, benzene lines, avian jet, aviation jet fuel. These lines ruptured um, with the, the fire growing in intensity. Um, a smaller tank, uh, triple one four, uh, ruptured at uh, Rift Two. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so the, the fire department was able to extinguish the smaller tank fire fairly quickly. Uh, they applied, I guess, uh, cooling lines on the tank and foam lines on the, the manifold fire. Um, and actually, the, the fire was declared under control. This didn't mean that it was put out. It meant that um, they didn't foresee any escalation and engines could start returning to the stations. However, um, there were a lot of communication issues between Gulf and the city fire department. For a start, the Gulf fire chief had forgotten his radio. Uh, this was characteristic of the strained communication through the day. Um, the fire department were not aware of the, the presence of 5% naphtha in the storage tank. This basically gave the, the crudes um, kind of physical properties akin to a volatile wellhood, wellhead fluid. Um, further, they, they didn't have any idea of the inventory in the tank. Only after the event, it was discovered that the, the levels had been completely fabricated um, by the operators. Uh, the city fire chief ordered that all pipelines feeding the manifolds be shut down. However, only the manifold valves of two large naphtha tanks were closed. Uh, the, the valves at the actual manifold rather than the tank were left open, and that would have a significant effect later. Okay, uh, so shout out to Ramin Apari, who um, who covered this incident in his graphic novel, Floating on Fire. Uh, this quite um, beautifully illustrates some of the process safety concepts. So at the Gulf Fire, um, they had massive issues with uh, firewater runoff. And as the, the firewater was being applied to, to cool the tank, it would have been expected to be captured within the tank dike area. However, Un, unknown to, to the firefighters, there was actually um, the dike drain valve was left open to the sewer. So everything that they were, they were applying to the tank escaped via the sewer and out onto the, the street. Uh, further, uh, some damage was uh, done to the, the tank dike during the, the firefight fighting operations. Uh, so they made moves to um, pump the, the, the firewater runoff to another tank dike. However, the, the drain valve on this was also left open, so they had to find another the source. I guess it might not have been as obvious as it's shown here. Um, it might have been on the ground. Um, but this here is, I think, the turning point in, in the incident. So the massive amounts of firewater runoff uh, were, were too much for the sewer pumps to handle. The sewer pumps were the only apparatus that was kind of getting uh, water away from the area. Um, kind of earlier on in the day, um, some of the firefighters, both Gulf and City, were working in the water underneath some power lines. Uh, one of them was damaged in the fire and you know, fell into the water, causing 
one of the firefighters to receive a, uh, an electric shock. Um, so the, the fire department um, made a move to apply uh, sort of mist lines and uh, so there'd be no further damage to the power lines. Uh, however, Gulf had a, an internal meeting and decided that the lines had to be de-energized and the fire department weren't made aware of this. Um, unfortunately, the power lines fed the, the sewer pumps, which, as I said, was the only pumps um, getting rid of the water. Um, so, yeah, the firemen only became aware as the street, the primary streets became completely inundated by water and firefighting foam. Uh, you can see here some of the images from the incident. So, on the left, uh, you can see the men in the background, probably knee deep in the water, going towards the, the tank fire, middle picture, kind of wading through it, and then the picture on the right, uh, yeah, kind of thigh deep in, in foam. Uh, one of the things, I was reading the report last night, one of the things I hadn't um, caught on to before, uh, apparently when Gulf were starting up their um, uh, foam concentrate system, the, there was there was a leakage to the sewer system. Um, there was two formulas, formula A and B, and I think it was the formula B that when combined with water, it gave a foam that uh, kind of closely resembled the appearance of, of the naphtha. Um, so we know that there was there was crude oil uh, kind of leaking into the, the streets and naps are floating on the surface of the water, maybe between the water and the foam. Looking at the map again, uh, you can see, yeah, kind of Avenue Y of the refinery completely flooded. Uh, the floods would have went all the way up Fifth Street, probably to an extent underneath the Penrose Avenue Bridge and up Fourth Street as well. Um, so the fire trucks and the pumper trucks and the foam trucks and the firemen were operating in kind of flooded street area. And I think the water level rose to the height of the hot exhaust of one of the trucks, which uh, ignited the naphtha layer. And the whole area was suddenly covered in flames. Um, I think there was three firefighters that were uh, traps in the initial fire area, but no, no way to escape. And a father five um, uh, tried to try to help them, and uh, unfortunately, those eight fatalities and two other fire firefighters received severe burns. Uh, so now I'm going to pass you on to Richard Ehrlich. Uh, he's a retired city firefighter officer and paramedic. And he's also the author of Firefighter Story, 30 Years on the Front Lines, uh, which uh, within that book, he gives probably one of the best uh, first-hand accounts of, of the 1975 fire. So over to you, Rick. OK, good evening, everyone. On you go, Rick. You're all good. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you. Okay, yeah, I was a Philadelphia firefighter for 30 years. Early in my career, I was a paramedic for five years and worked a rescue squad. And then I went back into firefighting and I was promoted to lieutenant. And for the next 21 years, I was involved in firefighting. Uh, I was uh, fortunate or unfortunate enough, depending on how you look at it, to participate in this Gulf fire. I was working night work at the time. My platoon started at 6 p.m. that evening. I first found out about the fire somewhere around lunchtime. I was in the car working my part-time job, and I heard on KYW, our news radio station in Philadelphia, the, of the extent of this fire and what was happening. And I followed, of course, as close as I could and called the station constantly to find out whatever information I could. And the the level of alarms went to so many that the city was almost completely deleted of firefighters in, in most of the city because of the companies that were involved in this extra alarm fire and they were telling people 
like myself that were on night work to come in as early as possible so that we could relieve the guys on the fire grounds and also man the stations that had been emptied by the extra companies that had been brought to this fire. And uh, that evening um, when we got to the firehouse, I got there, I think around five o'clock and then we got ready to be transported down to the fire um, by the police department. They usually would shuttle us in police cars and police vans from the station to wherever the fire ground was. And when we got down to Gulf, I was the DPOP. It's a designation driver pump operator. So my responsibility for the rest of that night was to stay by the engine that was pumping water through a heavy water line to a deluge gun that was shooting water onto one of the tanks, trying to not so much extinguish the fire, but just to cool down the tank, which was our, our main concern where I was. And I was there all night long. And uh, that was about it. I, I do remember it was a very difficult night after learning about what had happened to the firefighters, the deaths and, and the injuries and the burns of so many of them. So I remember just standing by the apparatus all night long, just praying for the guys that had been injured and, and hopefully praying for myself and my compadres that, you know, nothing would happen to the tank. And we were in harm's way, but, you know, we had to hope for the best at that point. Um, anything else uh, I can add to this point, or I don't think you want to take questions at this point, do you? I've, I've, uh, there's, there's more. Uh, any lessons for, for um, process engineers who who operate and sort of design well, these facilities? Unfortunately, I, I, I can't this. really speak of that because as a firefighter, um, our responsibilities are at the end of 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 the beginning of when the fire starts, we we don't get involved in in really on what the causes are or were and what can be done to prevent them. Not something to this magnitude. If it was a smaller fire like a dwelling fire, you know, we would certainly have exercises back at the station and we would talk about it and try to figure out ways to prevent it. But in a fire of this magnitude, it's it's really left up to the the engineers, the the real professionals who know more about the chemistry and and technical aspects of something of this nature. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like as as chemical engineers, as process safety engineers, we want to ensure that things never escalate to the point where we're putting you know, firefighters like Rick and his colleagues in, in danger. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rick. And um, yeah, you're welcome. I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so in the, the aftermath of the incident, there was about 10 million damage done to the refinery, which I think is maybe about 50 million in today's terms. Uh, four, four storage tanks appeared crumpled and melted whilst the burnt out the carcasses of five, five fire trucks lay next to the mangled manholes. You can see the picture on the right there, the, the fire trucks looking like, just like toys uh, next to the spaghetti pipe up. Uh, on the left, you can see the damage sustained to the brick uh, chimney stack facade in the initial explosion. Um, however, all of this uh, pales into comparison with the, the human cost. Um, yeah, so these are the faces of the, the eight, eight men that lost their lives. Um, we don't know too much about them other than that they were all family men. Um, Kind of left behind eight wives, 21 children. Uh, yeah, most of them were career firefighters. Others had served in the armed forces in, in Korea um, prior to joining the fire, fire service. And yeah, as I say, um, yeah, some of them died on on the on the day. Others um, others were in hospital for for days or weeks even. Uh, yeah, so. So horrendous human cost. Um, yeah, so the, there was a massive uh, sort of public reaction to the incident. It was you know, all over the newspapers. Um, it was really a watershed moment in, um, I, I guess, uh, refinery safety in the in Pennsylvania State area. Uh, so much so that um, you know, several days later, as the, the fire was still running out. Uh, the task force on refinery fires was 
um, requested um, by the, the city mayor. Um, this, this took a year or two um, to go through, but the outcome was mandated adoption on F of NFPA standards, uh, compulsory ta tank firefighting training for firefighters, hot work, work permits, routine testing of fire equipment. Um, in terms of the, that task force didn't look at this specific fire, it looked at all the refinery, refineries in the area. Uh, I'll skip that slide. Uh, so mo most of what I've told you today is based on a 12 page um, report that was issued by the Joint Fire Investigation Committee. Uh, this consisted of members of the police force, the fire department, as well as Gulf. Uh, however, there was another report that was completed by the Occupational Safety and Health Authority. Um, I wasn't able to find this report, but I did find newspaper articles about it. So the recommendations were in four different areas. Uh, first of all was equipment spacing. Um, so as we know in, in hydrocarbon facilities, we want to keep potential ignition sources um, separate from sources of potential hydrocarbon leak. And the recommended spacing between a boiler house and the storage tank at the time was 250 feet or 76 meters. Uh, we can see from the picture there that the, the storage tank is almost immediately adjacent to the boiler house and chimney stack. Uh, so it was unanimously agreed that the tank had no place being there. And when the when the facility was rebuilt the following year, the, the chimney stack went back in, but the, the tanks were not replaced in that location. The second recommendation was to have an auxiliary dike uh, just somewhere to put somewhere to direct the spent fire water. Um, certainly following the, the incident, uh, there was a fire safety committee formed within the refinery and they went through all, all of the storage dikes and, and reinforced them to make sure they couldn't be damaged uh, in subsequent operations. Uh, recommendation number three was high, to have high level alarms. Um, although this was 1975, um, this kind of monitoring technology was available. Um, yeah, so the refinery made a move to have less reliance on, on the operators uh, visually gauging the levels and strapping charts and more reliance on actually having, having alarms. Oops. Uh, recommendation four was to have remote shutoff valves. Uh, these were present on modern facilities, but of all the facilities such as this one dating back to the 1920s um, everything was done kind of manually you can see in in this picture here uh, when i mentioned earlier that it, only the only the manifold valves had been closed and not the actual tank valves of some of the lines that were feeding the fire uh, yeah, one of the other manifolds was engulfed in the flames and failed upstream of the isolation valve. And this, I think this was like a 90,000 barrel Napster storage tank. Um, the line ruptured and it was observed that the, the Napster was just spilling freely from, from the open pipe and igniting in, in midair. Uh, so there was this uh, you know, really kind of brave and hazardous um, intervention made. Uh, you can see uh, three refinery employees wading out through the flooded dike to the back of the storage tank uh, under a curtain of water from other firefighters. Um, at the back of the storage tank they were able to isolate the, the valve that was feeding the fire uh, and I reckon this, this might have been uh, the, the tank Eventually, the, the tank fire that Rick was fighting. Um, yeah, just to add my own two recommendations. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure if this was mentioned in the OSHA report. I haven't seen it. Um, but yeah, floating roof 
oil storage tanks should never be brought off floats unless in controlled circumstances for maintenance. Um, my second kind of learning is that um, dike drainage valves or bun storage valves should be always left in the closed position because otherwise it defeats the purpose. Um, there's going to be no, no containment in an instant uh, such as this. Okay. Yeah, so bringing things up to up to present day, um, in 2007, I believe, um, a series of memorial plaques were laid outside of the, the Fireman's Hall Museum in downtown Philadelphia uh, to honour each of the fallen. Uh, I believe the museum is a short walk from, from the Rocky Steps for any, anyone that's kind of visiting uh, Philadelphia. Um, now I'm going to pass you on to John Bichot. Uh, John's an operations supervisor, currently at Phillips 66, and has 35 years of experience at this refinery complex, both the Gerard Point Refinery and Point Breeze Refinery. So welcome, John. Can you hear us, John? You might be on mute, John. There we go. Is that better? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, good. Sorry about that. Uh, I started as an apprentice in December of 1985, and the old Arco Philadelphia refinery, which was bought out by John Doyce to run the facility, uh, I was one of a group of inexperienced people that was brought in to work with experienced staff to uh, start up uh, units that had been mothballed for several years. I was a paramedic before I uh, got into the refining industry. Uh, during this time, uh, safety was not really something that a lot of people put anything, uh, uh, a lot of stock in. If it, if it slowed you down or cost you money, a lot of people weren't interested in it. In 1985, 1986, lockout, tagout, as we know it, did not exist uh, in the facility I was working in. Uh, basically, you would block in a pump, per se, and uh, put do not operate tags on it and shut off the steam and put a do not operate tag there. If it was electrically driven, the uh, electricians would come out and then de-energize the switch gear, and then they would put their locks on which is really the closest to anything that we had to lock out, tag out. Eventually, Atlantic was sold to Sunoco. And uh, this is where safety becomes from a passive thing where we used to wait for uh, the safety guy to come around and sniff things for us and tell if it was okay to work on, especially with hot, hot work, to where it became more proactive. This is where we got into the beginnings of a real lockout, tag out program. Uh, this is where operation staff was engaged to make sure the equipment and things like that were very safe to work on. Uh, so there was still some input from the safety guys because we didn't do the gas testing at that time, but it was moving closer and closer to doing that. Uh, in 1994, Sunoco buys the Chevron Golf facility, which the site of the 1975 fire began. Uh, this is the integration of time when the integration of two uh, modes of safety here. One that was more uh, passive, which was seemed to be the Gulf uh, Gerard Point side, and more, which is a proactive Sunoco uh, Point Breeze side. <clears throat> In 1997, my units were shut down and I was transferred to the, uh, what they call the blending and shipping department, which is the marine and logistics end of things in uh, Gerard Point. And this is where I started working with about six to eight guys that had been there through the fire and explosion of the 1975 fire. Many things that they mentioned that did not go right uh, leading up to it is poor communication. Uh, guys didn't want to carry their radios. Uh, they also mentioned things like uh, our gauging systems we had. They apparently at that time were the very uh, unreliable Varex that were going we were being used at the time. So most of the tank gauging was done by guys going up top with a brass plumb bob and a reel that was calibrated in feet, inches, and so on. And then, what's it called, swing the tank, then come back and uh, 
go to a strapping chart and figure out how much stuff is in that tank. Uh, hopefully the person you had there was uh, good at math. But what I understand is the person that was gauging that tank tended not to go out and do the job. So then uh, we get to 2005. I'm promoted to a, a salary job. And now we also have the year of Texas City, the BP down in Galveston, Texas. At this point, safety becomes really, really hardcore. I mean, considering the number of people that were, were killed, the, the, the financial cost of this, the companies I was working for, which is still Sunoco, starts pushing very, very hard. Uh, we start uh, more education, better lockout, tag out. Uh, we have uh, uh, now an electronic permitting system. Seems magically whenever something went wrong, the paper permit books disappeared um, to make sure that you, know, you had a record of the permits taken care of. In 2012, I started working uh, up as a facility shift superintendent. And then later that year, I was promoted to a shift super, facility shift superintendent, which is the highest pure operations person you can have in the job. Um, some of the other people I know that were there at the 75 fire were complaining about the firefighting foam, and it was a stuff known as fomite. You had a component A and a component B, which was pumped through pipes and met at a mixer with water and formed the foam. Well, they also these guys also complained that the system was never properly maintained. Uh, another thing that they complained about, or at least they spoke about, and the tank dike valves, there was no indication whether they were open or closed. You could have them open and nobody would know it because it was just a long T-handle that stuck out of a valve box outside the tank dike. And uh, you know, so there was just a lot of things taken for granted that would happen. They spoke of once the fire had happened, one of the guys that I did used to work with, he swore he saw it flash back from number four boiler house. Okay, and probably not, not a great thing to see, but what you don't see in all those pictures is the pipes for the most part were laying on the ground in depressions or trenches. And uh, the trenches would fill up with water and oil and the fire would flash along the ground in these uh, conduits as we used to call them. Other things that they did is, as you know, they placed a tank that originally was not naphtha, but started using a naphtha too close to a boiler house. And that's really where it sucked in the fumes and good night, it lit off. So late in mid 2019, I left the uh, Philadelphia refinery. Thanks so much, John. Is, yeah. Is that you? Back to me? Or? Oh, I'm here. I'm just listening. Oh, yeah. Are you still going? Or? Sorry. No, I'm I'm finished with that part right now. Oh, yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so th this uh, picture here is is actually kind of semi modern day of of the refinery. Uh, so. Yeah, you can see that there's a lot of kind of kind of empty space there, a lot of kind of tank footprints where there's no longer tanks, kind of overgrown with grass. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the, the refinery is now being decommissioned. Um, because in June 2019, there was another massive um, explosion. Um, the company by that stage, the, the two refineries had been joined into like a single refinery complex, uh, came under the, the ownership of Philadelphia, Philadelphia Energy Solutions or PES. Um, I believe the, the 2019 incident um, was maybe due to lack of preventative, preventative maintenance, John, on, on a pipe containing hydrofluoric acid within the alkylation units of the refinery. Um, this resulted in like a disastrous series of explosions, which 
uh, released uh, hundreds of pounds worth of hydrofluoric acid to the atmosphere, pulled like multi-ton vessel fragments across the site. Um, thankfully, no one was injured, or no one was killed in this incident. There might have been a few injuries. There were um, a few injuries. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, the decision was made in 2019 to uh, shut down the, the refinery uh, permanently uh, with the loss of over a thousand jobs. Uh, so you have a, yeah, such a shame, like a refinery complex you can see here, uh, much of which has been, had been like actively refining for well over a hundred years. And then, yeah, it's all gone now or disappearing. Um, yeah, and, and you can see here. Yeah. 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 On you go. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, this was a mistake that was made in 73 or 75 when they were building this unit that carried forward into uh, recent history. Um, what you had was an elbow on a propane re discharge, uh, propane reflux pump, and uh, which had a small amount of HF in it, along with the propane. And this was a elbow on a pump that had not been inspected for some reason. It was also the wrong alloy for the service. And somehow, some way, a mistake where it never found it, its way onto an inspection route. And uh, it eventually failed on the morning of uh, the 21st at about 4.20 in the morning. And I was coming in where approximately where it says site of 1975 fire. I was on the bridge coming to work to relieve my... Uh, my opposite who was working that night and uh, we had this massive explosion. The explosion I saw was the one that most people saw on CNN if you were watching television that day. Um, we had five people that were slightly injured which is a blessing. Um, it's an event that ultimately led to the end of this facility. Um, I, like many others, were, they started laying people off in mid-August and uh, that was the end for a lot of us. Um, but you know, some of the things here that we had problems with in 1975, we had some of the same problems here. Uh, sewers still backed up in the streets, just like it had in 1975. Radio communications were, you know, a little spotty at sometimes. But all in all, the operations and emergency staff did a great job getting this place under control, and. Uh, you know, making sure that it did not become far worse than it was. Yeah, um, thank you, John. And yeah, it's just kind of quite haunting that the that failed elbow was like a kind of ticking time bomb that was there at the time or around the time of the 90, 1975 incident. And yeah, you know, 45 years later, um, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and you can see here on this slide the, the kind of distance between the two incidents. They're only uh, kind of maybe a kilometer or 1.2 kilometers apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so yeah, just to bring everything uh, together. Um, yeah, although like the 1975 incident is a his historic incident, it's one that can still happen today. Floating roof tanks are still operated in refineries and biorefineries as well. Um, so yeah, we have to you know, remember the instance of the past, um, because only by learning from the past is the future conquered. Um, yeah, I think that's all, the, um, that's all our content for today. Um, yeah, so yeah, we'll open the floor to any questions. I think back to you, Trish. Great, thanks for that presentation. I really enjoyed enjoyed that from all of you. I think it was really insightful from the perspective of the detail of the incident, but then to hear from someone that was there and to hear from someone that was working at that facility again, one when we saw um, the, the most recent incident. A question um, for both John and Rick, based on their experience in this, and and they've, you've sort of answered some of it in the way through, but 
What would be the key learning that you would like people to take away from this incident? So I might go to you first, um, John, if that's okay. Uh, from the Gulf Oil incident? Yeah, just from, from what you've described and, and what we've been through in the presentation, you know, if there's one key learning that people could take away, what would you think that should be? Um, I, I honestly believe in uh, citing of taking your hazards and putting them away from uh, known ignition points or things that they shouldn't uh, react with. Also, uh, there should be multiple uh, gauging systems on, whether uh, you've got a VAREC, which is a, uh, an active gauge that doesn't transmit anything to the inside, mm -hmm. and there should be a gauging system which has a uh, high 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 level alarm system and that's independent of any other gauging system that lets you know if this goes off there really is a problem here mm -hmm. um, and then there's got to be a high level of maintenance on these to make sure that they're accurate and uh, giving you the correct readings that are going on in tanks like this yeah. um, this was lucky it didn't get further than it did mm -hmm. And if we think back to the Bunsfield incident as well, there was very clearly some tank gauging related uh, issues there, not only with the tank gauges being faulty and not reading correctly, but the independent high level alarms not functioning, or high level shutoffs not functioning as well. So, you know, it's, it's one of those ones that we have tanks, we need to monitor the levels of them more effectively. Um, Rick, what, what's your thoughts? What, what would be the one lesson you'd like people to take away from this presentation today? Well, I, I agree completely with John, and, and he's the expert. I, I believe safety and, and maintaining these plants is, is the most important thing. Um, as a firefighter, people need to understand that when we go through our training program in the beginning, it's all basically involved in containment, extinguishment, and rescue. We do not really get involved in the technical aspect of these situations. We kind of leave that to the experts. and and we hope that they can devise and come up with, you know, better plans for for safety and maintaining these places. Because, you know, of course, they're they're so dangerous, they're so volatile. But um, again, I, I agree with John. But he's he's the one that really should be have these questions directed to because he's the expert. And and he and and you and and people like these engineers, they're the people. They're the guys that that have to do the research and develop new technical approaches to first preventing these situations and then ho hopefully if it, it you know gets involved in a fire then that's where we come in and that's where we take over but they're the ones that are more important than we are because they they have to maintain these places and and prevention is so important you know that prevention becomes more important than than extinguishment and rescue so we we kind of leave it to the experts to do that and and I have great respect for those people because they're they're the geniuses that have to develop these techniques. Thanks for that, Rick. Um, Ewan, do you have any comments that you'd like to make in terms of, of that sort of question? So you did a lot of research, obviously, into this to prepare this presentation. What was the, the one thing that you were left with that you thought, oh, I really want people to remember this and learn it? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, certainly, like, the... The, um, the most of failure of the, um, the floating roof storage type was a unique one, which I haven't really seen that mentioned anywhere in any you know, textbooks on, on that type of storage type. Um, I, yeah, I wasn't aware that it could be you know, underfilled as well as overfilled. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that, was, that was a key takeaway okay. for me. Great. Um, um, we've got a, a question in from the audience here. So you mentioned uh, the poor safety culture in 1985, only 10 years after a major incident, and then that Texas City happened in 2005 caused another renewed safety push. What other than incidents might be more effective ways to improve safety culture? Who wants to to have a go at that? John, is that something that you've got a, some thoughts on? You know, how do we improve safety culture without having to wait for the incident? Yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, you need to have, it has to come down from the top. 
Uh, and you have to have people that are willing to sit there and say, okay, there is a cost for safety and the cost is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, when you've got uh, things going on that when people are starting units up and things like that going, well, yes, we want to be safe, but we don't want to cost us money. It doesn't work that way. Um, some of the things you, know, you looked at lockout tag out, I can remember several incidents uh, that I wasn't directly involved in where people got injured because of things were not properly de-energized uh, of all the forms of energy that we use. And that when you, when you injure somebody, uh, their life changes forever. Okay, from that point going forward, whether they screwed up and did something they shouldn't have done, or you didn't uh, safe it a piece of equipment correctly for them to work on and they were injured, they're always forever changed. Uh, unfortunately, we have people that still believe that safety is a cost that they don't want to bear. Uh, the company I work for now is completely opposite. They're like, safety is the paramount of everything we do. If you gotta shut a unit down because it's unsafe, we have something unsafe going on, great. Shut it down, we'll fix it, we'll get it going again. And I think that's what people need more of, is that we can, we can run the product again, that's not a big deal. But what we need to be able to do is give the people who operate the units or give the people, someone passing by, sees a split in a pipe or a broken valve and stuff running out onto the ground to give them the authority to say uh, shut down now this is why without repercussion hey sometimes you might be wrong it happens uh, but ultimately in terms of everybody going home at the end of the day the way they came in you have to be able to do that you need to look at the safety systems make sure they're working correctly you need to audit them you need to audit the actions of your crews. So if you've got a crew that's going out and applying a lockout tag out, you sometimes have to come behind them and say, hmm, let's take a look at this and make sure that uh, what they've said they've done on energy isolation logs and things has been done and make sure the lockout is done in the correct manner. Have you taken into account all the energy, whether it's hydraulic, pneumatic, uh, steam, uh, do you have kinetic energy involved in such things? Has this been taken care of new and neutralized? And sometimes you will find that they've made mistakes, but then you have to fix that and make sure that they learn from the mistake. Learning mistake, learning from mistakes by killing people is, is not the lesson that we need to learn. We need to make catch with the mistakes while they're small, educate the people, and then continue on. But safety in, in whether it's chemical, petroleum, power generation, it still comes down to this. We have to make sure that our people go home. And certain aspect of safety is training, monitoring, and then the other half is also maintenance. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Um, Johnny, I think it's it's really, really important to have that that push from the top at the end of the day we can we can work from the bottom up, but we actually do need the leaders who are the people that make the decisions and that have the accountability for those decisions to make the right decisions, particularly when it comes to funding of, of safety. So I think I think that's a really important point. Um, and the verification aspect of it as well is is critical to my mind as well. Thank you so much for that. Um, that's that's the end of our webinar for today. Thank you very much. Um, for everybody for attending and in particular thank you to our three presenters you and Stuart Rick Ehrlich and John Bisher um Bisher close enough Bisher, sorry close enough <laughs> um really really appreciate the uh the time you've taken and the insights for something that obviously would have had some emotional um emotional impact and emotional aspect for you having both been so intimately involved with the incidents that we were discussing. So I really do appreciate you giving of yourself um, to that. In terms of upcoming Safety Centre webinars, we have another one coming up on the 30th of March um, that is at 11am Melbourne time and that will be looking at pre-startup safety reviews. 
Uh, and we then have um, another webinar coming up through chemical processing. So the chemical processing webinars that I do each year. So that is on the 13th of April at 3 p.m. US Eastern Time, um, where I'll be talking about weak signals. So the title of that um, that presentation is um, Finding Your Platypuses. If you come along to the presentation, you'll understand what that means. But it's all about managing, detecting and managing weak signals. Um, we've got one other last question that or would comment that's just come in that I'll just read out so people um, hear it. I can see the source of this incident was a misunderstanding in the design stage while the removal of the liquid level was lower than actual. There was a potential for vaporising the crude oil. This highlights the importance of design and operating parameters. Absolutely it does. Working within that operating envelope is so critical and if I think back to my early career, I operated um, oil, crew, oil ship unloading at a refinery into floating roof tanks for uh, a period of time. and. You know, we were always very, very conscious of never grounding the roof for the very reason that we saw in this particular incident. Um, you right. know, one of the first things that we learned was about how the roof worked. The fact you can't ground it unless you're taking the tank out of service, and that requires specific safety steps to make sure you don't cause a problem, not only in the vapour space, but also it's not unheard of in grounding a tank roof for the for one of the legs to actually pierce the floor if there's corrosion in the floor as well. So you can have all yep. sorts of implications from, from grounding tank, tank floating blankets or, um, or floating roots. Thank you very much, everybody. Please stay safe and we look forward to uh, you joining us on another webinar at some stage.